Hi everyone, this is lecture 11.1. .1. Uh, this time we'll be talking about re-entry and rehabilitation. So first we'll talk about um, a major paradox that prison has in American society. Uh, then we will talk about how rehabilitation may occur via community corrections. So Max Weber uh, highlighted one of the major premises to the study of society in his concept of ideal culture versus real culture. Um, namely that our ideal culture does not necessarily match our real culture. Uh, he defined ideal culture as what we want to believe and uh, that what we want to believe is different than uh, what we actually believe. So our ideal culture is what we want to believe and then our real culture is the way we actually behave. And this disconnect is especially highlighted by our society's attitudes toward prison and punishment. There are many ways where there is a disconnect between ideal culture and real culture in our society, but prison is just one of those ways. So Namely, this paradox can be seen in that 71% of Americans report that their, that their religion is Christianity. Um, and it should be noted that this rate of religiosity is much higher than other countries, say uh, Germany or uh, the UK. With that in mind, a central tenet of Christianity is forgiveness. But our criminal justice system is built to seek revenge. It is not built to rehabilitate. And we'll explore that. We've already explored that a little bit in this class, and we'll explore it more in this lecture. But um, if mo almost 75% of our population is dedicated to a religion that is said to seek forgiveness uh, and help people get better, um, it doesn't seem to make sense the way our criminal justice system is set up. So since the United States is heavily culturally influenced by Christianity, we would expect the ideal type um, of our prison system to be based on reforming convicted criminals. Uh, the fact of the matter that it, it simply is not. It's not the case. In our real culture, our prison system is not set up for rehabilitation. It is oriented toward deterrence, retribution, and incapacitation. Uh, just a reminder, if you need it from Social 101, there are four reasons why in our society we put people in prisons. There's rehabilitation, i.e. using prison to make people better. That's one way we could do it, even though our prison system is not set up that way. Uh, deterrence, uh, using prison to scare people into behaving. Retribution, using prison to seek vengeance or revenge. Uh, and incapacitation, using prison to stop people from committing crime. Well, what could we do in our prison system in terms of rehabilitation? Well, we could help people attain uh, high school or college educations. Uh, it is a fact that m many people that go to prison do not have uh, basic education or advanced education as you would find in a college. Uh, what else could it do? It could provide people with job training. Um, Merton strain theory tells us that one reason why many people uh, do commit criminal acts is because they don't have means to uh, make money otherwise. Uh, so if we would provide uh, prisoners with job training, we would uh, prevent uh, many of those innovator types that Martin talks about. Addiction therapy and detox programs could also be involved in uh, the American prison system. Uh, in addition to access to health care, all of those three things are available to a certain degree in the prison system, but um, they are greatly limited, right? Uh, basically, most of the budget regarding addiction therapy is uh, put toward uh, setting up um, things like Alcoholics Anonymous and uh, 
Addicts Anonymous, those kinds of programs. But those programs are really, really super duper low cost. If you have a bunch of folding chairs and some coffee, you can basically do those programs the way they're done on the outside. Um, this would be talking about more thorough, more, um, more uh, in detailed type of care. And then psychological therapy is, is something else that we could offer prison inmates because if people are committing crimes, the really good chance is that they have at least uh, modest psychological problems, or they could develop psychological problems while they're in prison, which is highly likely to happen. And all of these five, these are all good things and they're all present in our prison system to a modest degree, but these are the first programs to get cut, especially in for-profit prisons. And uh, Orange is the New Black is by no means a documentary, right? There's a lot of things that are uh, stretched in that show, but the discussion of the nature of for-profit prisons and how for-profit prisons do cut programming uh, toward the end of more profit, that's actually explored in very interesting detail in uh, the second season of Orange is the New Black. So let's talk a little bit about rehabilitation as it occurs via community connections, corrections. Um, our prison system, when people are in, they don't receive very much rehabilitation at all. The way the current prison system is set up is that if you're going to receive any kind of rehabilitation, it may occur after um, you have been released from prison. So most rehabilitation system in the American Corrections System occurs via community corrections, which are defined as an important component of the criminal justice system that has the power to intervene on multiple levels over time to influence positive outcomes in the individual, the community, and the system. So community corrections, a big piece of it happens during the probation period after you're released out of prison, uh, but there are other places where it uh, comes into fruition as well. Uh, the person doing uh, Community corrections is usually the community corrections officer. This is a person who is a type of combination police officer and social worker. Uh, this person attempts to find alternatives to uh, incarcerating offenders, i.e. putting people in prison. Uh, two very common examples of community corrections officers are probation officers, which could say, be said to uh, happen before prison, hopefully not before anything. Um, this person helps people who have gotten in trouble with the law avoid going to prison in the first place. Uh, if the probation officer isn't successful in that and the person goes to prison, af after they get out, the person may have will have a parole officer, and the parole officer is after prison and helps people uh, to keep from going back to prison, keeps people from uh, doing recidivism, as we've talked about in the course. Now, one problematic attitude within community corrections is uh, what's called the nothing works attitude. Uh, this is a defeatist attitude held by many community corrections officers and others in the system. It's not just CCOs. That uh, basically that much of the system as it exists is useful, is, is not useful. So that, well, there's no reason to do any of this. Uh, many of these attitudes are likely the result of professional burnout, namely, uh, and we see this in social work, we see this in other, dis other disciplines, other professions, uh, the person doing the very hard work of being a CCO, just um, they, they can't take it anymore. The job's too hard, they've been defeated too many times, uh, and that can lead to that kind of attitude. Uh, it is, and it should be noted in my parentheses there, really, really hard to be a community corrections officer. Uh, this, re re However, research clearly indicates that nothing works attitudes, there's nothing behind it, right? Uh, it's easily disproven once you actually show evidence that there are some programs that do work and do work really super duper well. And I'll talk about those here now. So what works? Risk assessment tools work. 
Risk assessment tools, there are a variety of tools that allow the classification of offenders into low, moderate, or high risk of offense. And if we can figure out who's a low risk, a moderate risk, and a high risk, we can get them the kinds of help or, if necessary, the kind of moder uh, monitoring they need to make sure that they don't offend again. Uh, these risk assessment tools guide correction personnel to determine what level of control and treatment are needed uh, to have the greatest possible effect for the individual. So what is actually happening uh, to measure in the person's life? And maybe we don't need to handle a low risk offender with a high risk offender kind of uh, treatment, right? Uh, and this allows for greater, greater evidence-based practice. If we can figure out what degree of crime or criminality the person may be uh, have a potential for, we can uh, apply what is uh, appropriate um, tools. Another element that works is risk need responsivity, also known as R&R. These are programs that target offenders' risks, needs, and responsivity. Uh, these have shown to repeatedly reduce recidivism among high-risk offenders. So if we can figure out, uh, say, that a person uh, doesn't really have any friends on the outside and they would have a hard time um, getting uh, shelter, for example, or if this particular person is perfectly fine with finding shelter, but they're super unemployable, right? We can figure out what resources can be got to that person that would help them most specifically, and that then could uh, help set up a person for success as opposed to set them up for failure. Cognitive behavioral treatment is a type of uh, psychological therapy that can definitely help uh, via rehabilitation. So CBT helps the um, client figure out how to engage in what's called here and now behavior, right, or therapy. And actually, uh, CBT is super helpful for all kinds of psychological trauma, uh, but it is also very helpful for prisoners. So if a person is in a stressful situation, instead of focusing on, oh, you know, my kid isn't here. Oh, I miss my kid. I miss my loved ones. Can you believe that I just had to spend five years in prison? All that. It helps the purpose person focus on the problem that they have in front of them right now. How am I going to get through this day at work? How am I going to get through uh, this situation? I don't need to commit a crime to get through it. And really, this kind of here and now thinking helps people address problematic thinking and helps alter their behavioral patterns in a way that um, help people uh, readapt to life a little bit better once they've been released from prison. Another uh, tool that works is what's called singular interventions focused on offender needs. I touched on something similar to this a couple slides ago, but this specific tool focuses on the projected needs of the offender in order to prevent recidivism. So this kind of uh, wraparound care can be used to get someone the education that they might need, get someone the housing that they might need, the mental health, the substance abuse, the employment issues. If a person is already highly educated, maybe we won't pay a lot of attention to that. If a person's already a homeowner, we won't really necessarily pay attention to that. We'd put those resources otherwise uh, where they would need it. Uh, that is uh, effectively to create a tailor fit for the individual and to uh, help them succeed the best to which they can. Cultural competency is also very important uh, re regarding community corrections. And this is something that we do uh, for correction officers themselves. Uh, correction officers and anyone that deals with uh, inmates needs to be aware of issues surrounding race and ethnicity, of gender, of class, education, age, and all other demographics 
to to understand the differences between people. Uh, this is one of the prime areas where a knowledge of social sciences can really help uh, a corrections officer or anyone else really um, be able to operate with someone and work with someone in a really hard situation, such as having, you know, watching over someone in, in prison. So there are, is another tool called the Serious and Violent Offender Reentry Re Initiatives, S-V-O-R-I. These programs uh, provide a continuum of care between the prisoner and the community. Uh, these are often known as wraparound services that I just touched on. Uh, gener in general, wraparound services are services that provide the client and the offender specialized and specific needs and it significantly increases the number of services utilized by ex-offenders. So um, as opposed to just offering people a general, okay, this is what you get when you get thrown out, get out of prison, we're gonna give you 200 bucks and a suit, right? Which is kind of a traditional thing that was given to people when they leave prison. Well, that won't get you very far. 200 bucks might get you to the closest city, uh, and the suit is, I guess, something you can wear. But the fact of the matter is um, that if we do help people uh, create their new lives, then they uh, commit, they recommit uh, crimes less. And now let's touch briefly on what doesn't work. Um, intensive supervision programs do not work. Uh, these are shown to not reduce recidivism, and unfortunately, ISPs are very common in community corrections. Effect, what, what is ISP? It involves uh, high monitoring of people once they're left out of prison and paying a lot of attention and trying to be very, very strict and getting people on technical violations Examples of these being not checking in at exactly the right time, um, punishing people for not getting a job, uh, punishing people for ever so slightly by like a no matter of like 100 feet or so, leaving their defined um, parole areas and not letting for any circumstances, any wiggle room in uh, slightly violating their parole. This kind of um, lack of letting people wiggle room uh, has been shown to be really uh, closely linked with putting people back into prison uh, for something for super minor infractions, things that aren't even crimes for people that aren't uh, on uh, parole, right? Um, and that, that kind of treating someone that's just gone out of prison like that uh, has been shown scientifically to, to simply not work. So that is it for uh, the lecture for this unit. Uh, I look forward to uh, helping you engage these topics uh, this week, and I will talk to you soon.